This is Rumble. And this is Michael Moore. Today, our guest, New York Times bestselling author, John M. Barry, author of The Great Influenza. But first, we have a new underwriter. Our new underwriter is Audible. This is the audiobook company. Probably now more than ever, it's a wonderful time to listen to an audiobook. I can tell you the books I've read and have then listened to on Audible, it's so much better. For instance, Bob Dylan's Chronicles Volume 1, that's his autobiography. To listen to the audiobook of that with Sean Penn reading Bob Dylan's autobiography, it's just brilliant. It's a wonderful way to reach people. I've recorded many of my own books with my own voice. It's a wonderful experience. And as a special offer to my listeners, they have a sign-up thing here where you can get a free book, get one of my books. Um, (laughs) Anyways, if you want to sign up for that or to get any one of the many free books that they offer, you just have to go to audible.com slash rumble, or you can text them. You just got to text the word rumble to 500, 500, text in the word rumble and you'll be signed up for a trial offer and a free book. So support them. They support me and I'm grateful to them for allowing a voice like mine to be heard in a time like this. This is rumble and this is Michael Moore and Uh, We have an important episode uh, today because we're going to be talking to the author, John M. Barry, uh, who wrote the book, The Great Influenza, the story of the deadliest pandemic in history. Uh, That would be the, um, what's called the Spanish flu of uh, 1918. And um, John is a uh, a professor at uh, Tulane University's School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine Let me welcome John uh, to Rumble. Thank you very much for taking the time today to do this. Well, thanks. So in 1918, what were the big mistakes that were made with the the influenza uh, uh, pandemic? Well, number one, they lied. And number two, by and large, when they did interpose social distancing, they did it too late. What did they lie about? Well, there was an infrastructure that had been created for the war propaganda arm of the government called the Committee for Public Information. And the architect of that committee said, all that matters is the impact. So that was the mindset of people who ran this. There was no difference between truth and falsehood. It, it's, it, you know, all that mattered was the impact of what you said, you know, you're trying wow. to get it. So that's pretty extreme. And that was the mindset. Again, that wasn't set up for influenza. That was set up for the war keep morale up. They did things like in an army camp, they banned songs like I wonder who's kissing or not. Uh, you know, sauerkraut was renamed Liberty Carrot cabbage. Teaching a German was banned in schools, so forth and so on. I mean, this is the context. So influenza erupts and avoid hurting morale. I put that on in quotes, more or less, or quote, damaging the war effort. National public health leader said, this is ordinary influenza by another name. And the Surgeon General of the U.S. said, you have nothing to worry about if proper precautions are taken. So they just said it was just like any other flu. Correct. And people knew that was a lie very rapidly. As soon as the virus appeared in their community, you could die in less than 24 hours. That didn't happen often, but it happened enough. You, the disease was initially misdiagnosed as dengue, typhoid, cholera. So the symptoms were quite often quite severe and not normally associated with influenza. Uh, probably the most horrific symptoms. You could bleed from your, not only from your nose and mouth, but from your eyes and ears. And uh, in the book, I quote one doctor writing a colleague, that people was turning so dark blue from lack of oxygen that he had difficulty distinguishing between white soldiers and black soldiers. Uh, and that, mm-hmm. them, of course, spread rumors of black plague. So when these things are occurring, 
and the public health authorities are telling you this is ordinary influenza by another name, you very rapidly <laughs> lose trust in what you're being told. Uh, and as a result, and, and you know that that national message, Wilson himself never made a public statement about the disease, not one. Uh, no, you're, that's not. Is that right? I mean, during never. this whole time, 1918, 19. <laughs> 19, he never... Not one statement, ever. Oh, my God. He was focused entirely on the war. Yeah. In local communities, most of them echoed what was occurring, what, those statements I just uh, repeated from the national uh, lead, public health leaders. And often they were quoted verbatim in local papers. You know, they had Associated Press and so forth back then. Uh, so... I focus in the book on, on one city where it was particularly bad, uh, Philadelphia. And in Philly, they went so far as when they finally closed all schools, bars, restaurants, theaters, uh, banned any public gathering, closed, you know, banned church services. One of the newspapers actually said, this is not a public health measure. You have no cause for alarm, unquote. So all that says is you can't believe anything you read in the newspaper. That's all that message says. So did that, did that result in when the public health officials then were trying to get people where they were really telling the truth and trying to get them to do certain things, the people didn't believe them? Frankly, you didn't need to be told to social distance by that time, in a place like Philadelphia, the streets were empty regardless. Right. You know, we have that symptom right now here. It's not a symptom. I mean, it's just a result. Or you saw the same thing. I'm sure you saw photographs of empty uh, Beijing and so forth uh, in January, early February. Uh, right. Fear will have plenty of effect. Uh, the, the impact, however was negative in the sense that it meant that, you know, I think society is based on trust when you come right down to it. Sure. sure. And trust was disintegrating. And it basically said, you're on your own. And it was kind of an atomization of society. We're right now, we're not having that, thank God. Uh, at least here I am in the French Quarter. I can give you examples, but let me finish my thought on, on uh, 1918. In the very few cities where they did tell the truth, and I mentioned San Francisco in the book, they seem to have a very diff different response. I mean, in, in, in Philadelphia, you have reports of people starving to get death because nobody would bring them food. And that same thing, the Red Cross reported that occurring in rural communities as well, not just a big city, but also in, in rural areas where you would have expected community, family, and so forth would have overcome that. There are the things that, that those people who are listening, or even myself, that we can do to pitch in to help, even though we're not medically trained. Are there, you know, as we get, I just feel like we're a week or so away from an onslaught uh, well, where the healthcare system is going to be so overwhelmed that we're uh, all going to have to figure out what to do here. That's a good question. And I wish I had the answer to it. And after I get off this recording, I'm going to uh, call up some folks and see if there's something that they can suggest. So the next time somebody asks me that I'll have a good answer. Uh, so thanks for asking, but I can't. Uh, okay. <laughs> Well, um, no, that's okay. You don't have to have the answer to, to every question. It's not a quiz, but I'm like, but I just, when you said that about your dentist friend, of course he can do medical things. You know, they, they, they go to a medical school to be a dentist for many years. Right. So, and they have to be prepared for something happening in that chair. If something goes wrong, which it can, if somebody cardiacs, if somebody, you know, I mean, things can happen. You're dealing with the mouth and so much of, of, of what happens in our mouth with our teeth, our gums, et cetera, that goes into our blood system. It, it, um, so these, so dentists do know how to do a number of, especially emergency, uh, things if, if something happened. So 
I didn't think of that either before you, you know, suggested that. And, and, uh, um, I now put out a call to all dentists who are listening to this podcast to, okay. to, to do what they can do uh, to offer their services. Okay. To get back to your larger question. Yeah. Yes. The larger, the global question. Yes. Yeah. I would expect this to get widespread, you know, in the millions of cases in the United States. And we're lucky if it's only in the millions. We're lucky if it'll only be in the millions. Right. As opposed to, I honestly, I don't see how we avoid tens of millions. It would be great if we could, if we could avoid over a hundred million, that would be a significant achievement. That, uh, you're talking about now people coming down with it. Correct. Not, not people dying, obviously. Correct. 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 So, so it could, but it could be, I mean, I've, I mean, they have sort of said this, it could be up to a hundred million people. I, I've quoted somebody from the NIH who said that, that the worst case scenario is one out of two will get it. Governor Cuomo here yesterday said that in New York, um, uh, 40 to 80% of the people, 80% is four out of five people will contract, uh, the coronavirus, uh, uh, yeah. at some and, point during, and, and he's the first politician I heard say that this is going to go on at least possibly nine months. Although, you know, my sources, um, at the NIH and other places have told me this could be a rolling, um, Oh, that, that's pandemic. the way I see it. A rolling. You see it that way too, that it could go, yeah. it could go two years or longer. Right. But in waves. Exactly. It, it peaks. We all stay inside. Then it subsides. We all come out live our lives for a few months and then boom, uh, it's still there with us. It's found new hosts and, and we go back inside. And is that pretty much how, what that means a rolling, uh, a, a pandemic? I would hope by the time a second wave came around, we would have, uh, appropriate testing. Number one, a lot of the population would be immune because they've already been exposed because they've had it. Uh, right. Mm -hmm. Uh, no, number two, by then, we would certainly have proper testing, plenty of tests. So we would have an opportunity to dampen that second wave significantly with testing, isolation, and so forth. So I would not necessarily automatically assume we're going to have to have the kinds of closings that are going on right now. I would kind of be surprised if that were the case. And then what happens by the third the third wave? We we will have been uh, we have, will have a vaccine. One would hope. Yeah, it's a hope. It's a lot of hope here, isn't it, John? Because well, there's, we there's a little bit yeah, more than that. Uh, they've been but they've been working on a vaccine for malaria forever. There isn't one. There's no vaccine for the common cold. Uh, this is a rapidly muta mutating virus. Doesn't mutate quite as rapidly as influenza. Uh, influenza, of course, you need a new vaccine every year. Measles mutates just as rapidly as influenza, but a vaccine is virtually 100% effective pretty much for life. And the difference is that viruses have what they call conserved portions of the virus. If those portions of the virus change, the virus cannot function. Uh, I'm not a virologist, so I don't want to talk explicitly about coronavirus, but I know enough about the influenza virus to talk about that, and you can be somewhat similar. So when an influenza virus invades a cell, when that cell six to eight hours later, whatever, uh, explodes, it will expel between 100,000 and a million virus particles. But it mutates so rapidly that only 1% of those particles will be able to function as a virus and, in, and infect another cell. So the conserved portions of the virus, is the, the, an influenza, the problem is that the immune system does not easily see the parts of the virus that are conserved, that can't change the <laughs> virus to function. So you target the vaccine at other parts of the virus which do mutate rapidly. It looks like on the coronavirus, what's called the spike, which sticks out from and helps give the virus its name, it looks like the spike on this virus seems stable, although the virus does mutate rapidly. So that is reason to be optimistic about 
an effective vaccine. You know, there are more things involved in developing a vaccine than just that, uh, but that's pretty important. And then in addition, you know, artificial intelligence, supercomputing and so forth uh, is already identified, as I'm sure you're aware, several uh, possible drugs that could work against this. And they are being tested. Obviously, New York got, I think, 70,000 doses of the right. malaria drug. Prior to that, the company Gilead has a drug that was developed against Ebola, uh, which actually failed. Well, it, it worked somewhat against Ebola, but several other drugs worked better against Ebola, so it was abandoned as an Ebola drug. However, that looks like it will have some impact. That's being tested. Those tests started a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and there are other candidates as well. Uh, there was some hope for an anti-HIV combination of a couple of drugs. But in fact, several weeks ago, Shanghai abandoned it as a treatment because it wasn't working. And then in the last few days, there was a, a scientific journal paper saying it didn't work, although I still see it mentioned as a possibility. Uh, you know, but there may well be other drugs out there that can be identified. So if we can hold on until we have a, a drug, much less a vaccine, we'll be in a lot better shape. And then and the way and the way we hold on is doing all the things we're being told to do: wash your hands, and your distance, exactly, and trying to get compliance on these things. <laughs> One of the less optimistic parts of looking at 1918 and the, uh, the op-ed in the Times mentioned it. Uh, it was a very good epidemiologist who looked at what happened in army camps. 99 camps quarantined, you know, isolated people as soon as if they, they were in many cases taking their temperature, checking symptoms of soldiers in the camps twice a day, isolating them if they had a symptom. If two soldiers in a unit had symptoms, the entire unit was like uh, quarantined. It turns out 120 camps, 99 did that, 21 did not. There was no difference between the camps that did and the camps that did not. Why was that? Because of leakage. Because over a period of time that it leakage? Yes, the, the enforcement of the quarantines and so forth. You mean what? They weren't they weren't enforced as well Rigidly as originally we, enough. You know, people got yeah. lax, and even in the army during the war. And the epidemiologists, however, went beyond behind pure statistics and actually investigated to see how well each camp performed, and discovered that a very few camps they rigidly enforced these uh, quarantines and other measures. And in those camps, there was benefit. However, so few of them did it, the numbers were lost statistically when you looked at the total. So we, we, what you're saying, how that affects us today is that we all say we're washing our hands, but maybe not as well or not, not that's, as often. That's correct, but even more to the point, you know, compliance with the social distancing. The social distancing. Okay, so let's, so let me... So let's take me as an example here and tell me if, if what I'm doing is right uh, or wrong. Uh, so I'm in day 13 now of my own self-imposed exile, my uh, uh, staying in, in the apartment, uh, uh, not going out, uh, not having uh, people over. Um, you know, I've had no symptoms. I, I've not been in contact with anyone, although a woman in our apartment building did pass away. Um, a few days ago, uh, with, with the virus and, um, but they didn't quarantine the rest of the building. They just brought in people to do the, whatever they do, the fumigating, um, disinfecting, uh, in all the, you know, hallways and uh, lobby or whatever, but it doesn't, I, you know, I don't, I don't uh, go out, but okay. Now having said all that, I've, I've told you what a good boy scout I am. Uh, now the truth, all right. Um, on day six of my quarantine, um, I had I was going a little you know like stir crazy in here, and this was this is uh, back when the theaters were still open, and I thought, boy, it's Sunday it's Sunday morning, 
you know, these Sunday morning, morning matinees never have anybody at them. And you can go online now when you buy a ticket and you can buy your seat and you can see how many other seats are bought. So I looked for a movie where there was, there were no other tickets sold mm-hmm. for the movie, like a 10 a.m. movie. I bought a ticket. I bought a ticket. I took Clorox wipes with me. Um, well, that's the bad part. Uber, <laughs> uh, down, uh, to, Doesn't matter. I wiped the, I wiped the whole Uber down. Before I sat in it, it's I primarily wiped, I wiped the handles, you know, I wiped everything. And particles, it's uh, in the air, in the air. Okay, so the Uber driver. Here's what the Uber driver had done. He had encased himself in plastic. He had uh, sealed off the front seat area to the back seat area in serious plastic mm-hmm. with duct tape. Though I mean, the thing was, it looked pretty airtight uh, to me. You know, so I got in it, I went down there, there were three other people in the theater, but you know, there were, you know, 20, 30 rows in the theater. So I sat 10 rows away from anybody, watched the movie and wiped the seat down, did all that, um, and came back home. You're saying even with all those precautions that, um, in violating my own quarantine on that day. Um, I increased my risk. Well, you know, first, let me say, I go for several walks a day. My wife and I go for several walks a day, and we're both over 70. Uh, you know, and we just stay away from people. I don't think there's a need to, you know, of course, we walk right out on the street. You know, I don't have to get on an elevator, uh, so forth and so on. You may have those uh, difficulties. Um, you know, you can't go crazy. No, but your first reaction, your first reaction was that I made, I, I made maybe a mistake in doing this. The Uber is, is a problem. If you have a car, you'd have been better off driving your own car. Or, or walking. Or walking. Yeah. Because the theater was uh, just, uh, you know, a couple of miles away. So I could walk two miles. But those days are over now. The movie theaters are closed. All right. So now let me ask you this. All right. So, um, uh, Nobody comes into my apartment except the executive producer of this podcast is uh, sitting about 10 feet uh, from me over at the board. Uh, and, uh, and so Basil uh, has come in uh, to my apartment on the few occasions, especially when we have a guest, um, just to run the board. So she said, I don't have to run the board and, and do the interview at the same time. Um, he he comes into my apartment. There is a bathroom right there at the beginning of the apartment. It's now called Basil's bathroom. <laughs> Sorry, Basil. Um, and um, he is known for other things. Uh, I just want people to know. Um, but uh, he goes in there. He, he changes the clothes. He walks. He walked here. Um, uh, walked across Central Park. Uh, went in. Goes into the bathroom. Changes from his outdoor clothes to the indoor clean clothes that he's brought. Um, we have Lysol down, uh, this whole studio. Uh, we've Clorox wiped everything. We stay away from each other. And, um, but he's in, he, we're in, we're in the same room right now and he's over there, uh, at the board and, uh, he'll be here, you know, for the length of this. And then, um, you know, we have to, well, let me say yeah. in the most technical sense, yeah. you know, there's some real modicum of risk, but you have to live. I mean, I had an old coach of mine who said all he wanted to do was live until he died. <laughs> so you can't right. completely isolate yourself from humanity for an extended period of time. Right. My, my dark Irish uh, uh, version of that, uh, uh, what, what your old coach said, is um, uh, I find living to be highly overrated. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I hope everybody understands that in the context it was meant. Um, uh, that's just the Irish in me speaking. Uh, okay. Well, it's not Irish, but there's a guy around here who plays bagpipes, which, of course, is the most haunting sound you can imagine in an empty French Quarter in particular. No, I would want to hear that. <laughs> <It's>, yeah. <laughs> right, but what you're saying is, is, yes, we have to live our lives, but you're staying inside, right? Except for your, except you go out on your, you go out on your walks. Go for, walk. you go for the walks. You're right. In fact, and there are people outside walking too. You're not the only one walking. Correct. 
and we keep our distance, but we're actually quite friendly. As I was saying earlier, a real sense of community is developing uh, for those of us around here. Um, you know, my dentist friend whom I mentioned earlier, we had dinner last night, you know, about 20 feet apart, different tables on, uh, you know, sitting outside and on the patio, mm -hmm. order takeout, which incidentally, takeout food is safe. That's important to know. Why would you say that? Um, just as a just as a fact, it is safe. Why? Tell me what. Um, back up the fact for that, because that people are scared. Well, I'm quoting. I'm. I know, and that's why I'm saying. I'm, I'm on this one. I'm relying on expert advice from a couple other people whom I asked to confirm that. One being uh, Sanjay Gupta, who's you mm -hmm. know detailed that on the air. Another being uh, Mike Osterholm, mm -hmm. who is uh, runs the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy. He's a good friend of mm -hmm. mine. Uh, I asked both of them independently. They said no problem. Uh, you got to be careful with the packaging. They get out of the package, wash your hands, discard the package. But the combination of heat and humidity and so forth, I guess, in the uh, in the process. Uh, okay, we live where it's you know, cold. We live where it's cold, though. So uh, the delivery person delivers it in a bag. They've touched the bag. Um, right. So just make sure you wash your hands after you take the... Uh, when I said heat and humidity, I meant the cooked food. Oh, I see. Not, okay. Not the outside. I thought you meant the French the quarter. Yeah, okay. Yeah, right. Uh, you know, again, the packaging, the bag, that that is potentially a problem in theory. Discard that. Put the food on your own plates. Discard the packaging. Wash your hands. And you're okay. I heard that if you then microwave the the food, the microwave uh, can kill the virus if there, if it's on the food. Um, I don't know that for a fact. Okay, so no I'm people listening to that wrong. don't don't take that as fact. Then I'm just just uh, something. I mean, I heard. It may very well be. Uh, it may very well be. I've I've wondered about that myself. I haven't. You know, okay. I'm not a virologist. Uh, well, I'll investigate that in a future podcast. I'll I'll let people know if that's true. But nonetheless, what you say is this is it's safe. Put, uh, put the food on the plate, wa wash your hands before you touch any of the food uh, or the, or right. the plate or the silverware or whatever. Uh, do do right. the good, exactly. the good scrubbing that we're all, we're all doing right now. And, uh, and then you're fine. You have your dinner. Correct. You have something. So back, back to, back to Basil though, the executive producer of this endeavor, uh, this uh, podcast rumble. Um, he's sitting over there at uh, 10 feet uh, from me. He does his own self-isolation at home. He's had nobody over to his apartment. Um, he hasn't gone out to, to anything other than to the grocery store to get food. Um, but that's it. Uh, I mean, we both have agreed to be extremely careful and that when we have to work, when we are doing this podcast, we're going to work in this manner where, um, you know, we, we're as careful, I guess, as we can be, but are we making a mistake? That was my point. And, and because you can say, yes, it doesn't mean the podcast is going to end. I know how to operate the board. I know how to, you know, I'm, I'm, I've been a filmmaker for many years. I know how to, the equipment works. I can, I can function. Um, but, um, the quality of the sound and the, all the things that go into bringing this to people, uh, obviously it helps if, if, uh, the producer of the of the show, the episode, yeah. the podcast I mean, is it, here. Is it? Is there any risk? Yes. Is it a reasonable risk to take? Yes. You're if you know he's self isolating in his apartment. The only interaction is his coming to your place. I would say that's okay. What if? What if? Um, now, see, both of us are are uh, single. I don't want to give away too much personal information here, but <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, yeah that, that but what if we? Biggest but, danger. But what if biggest danger is sanity? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. That we are. We were already lonely people, and now now we're into now we're in an enforced loneliness. Feel free to feel free to call me after the recording is finished. <laughs> 
We can talk about Roger Smith together. <laughs> right. You mentioned before we went on, uh, turn the microphones on here, that you had actually interviewed Roger Smith, the Roger of my first film, Roger and Me, the chairman of General Motors. And uh, um, the, um, okay, so, so, but basically, what about the people, though, when they, when you say they're self isolating, but they have a partner, they're married, they have two kids. They're, they're, they may be safe. Well, that, that, it's actually probably easier if you have company. I mean, if my wife weren't right here, I'd go out of my mind. You would like those soldiers in 1918, because you're human, you would violate, you'd say one day, one day is not going to hurt. One day is not going to hurt if I that's right. mingle. That's right. And I think that's right. what you. Well, you know, I, I personally, because of my awareness, you know, maybe I'd be able to refrain from that. But, you know, mo you know, another point, again, it comes down to discipline. Uh, in SARS, a lot of healthcare workers died. Uh, it's hypothesized a lot of them uh, infected themselves taking off their protective equipment. They got a little lax, you know, at the... Uh, I don't know if you mentioned it, but uh, roughly 15 years ago, when the government started planning for a pandemic, you know, I was uh, part of the working groups that tried to put together the initial plans. And at the very first meeting, we had a gentleman from the hospital in Hong Kong, who, which had by far the best record of any hospital that dealt with a lot of SARS patients in terms of its healthcare workers not getting sick and dying. And the point he made with us is lasted. And to translate in American terms, it came down to blocking and tackling. Fundamentals. Everybody knows how to, or every trained person knows how to take off their protective equipment. But you have to do it right every time, all the time. You cannot relax. Attention to detail. And, you know, in my former life, I was a football coach, too, and used to, you know, every day I talk about attention to detail to the team. I remember one entire practice. I, you know, I didn't like the way we were doing jumping jacks to warm up at the beginning of the practice. And I was trying to make a point that you got to do everything right if you're going to do it. So we spent the entire practice doing jumping jacks to make sure that we did jumping jacks right. Uh, detail. Uh, you know, that's important. I think at some point, I mean, clearly at some point, the question is at what point? Uh, the various restrictions will be relaxed and people will go out again. Mm -hmm. The disease will still be there. Or it's not going to be gone. Uh, you know, we have to figure out a way to handle this. The purpose of what we're doing right now is to try to get ahead of the disease so that the stress on the healthcare system is something it can handle. That is what we're trying to accomplish so that we don't have that 5.8% fatality rate in Wuhan, that we're more like the 0.7% in the rest of China. That's what we're trying to do. We are not going to outlast the virus. We are not going to lock down American society or anywhere else in the world for months at a time. It's not going to happen. Uh, you know, but we have to figure out at what point is the point where we start, you know, turn the key and society starts to go back to work, while at the same time we protect people who are most vulnerable. We have not figured that out yet. I am waiting for, I guess, actually Cuomo, I think maybe today uh, is, is you know, making noises uh, around that. and. Some of the uh, public health leaders, you start reading their op-eds and they're moving in that direction. And to the extent that anybody listens to me, I'm certainly moving in that direction. Not that I have an answer for it yet, uh, but I think uh, Mark Lipsitch, who's a 
epidemiologist at Harvard and was one of the first people to say 40 to 70 percent of the world's likely to be infected. Uh, I think he's got an op-ed today on Bloomberg, you know, discussing points like this. I know Mike Osterholm, who's a good friend of mine, uh, I mentioned earlier, Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy. He's essentially said something very similar uh, in the Washington Post uh, yesterday or, or in the last couple of days. It all kind of meshes together. We've got to figure that point out. We cannot stay locked down for six months, and we will not be able to outlast the virus. Give me one of the things, as we all, we're all going to have to formulate a plan here. So give me an idea, one idea of, of what that would look like, of what we could do to uh, both um, keep our sanity, but also to stay safe and stay alive. Well, again, if the medical care system gets staffed up, and has an adequate supply of ventilators and other resources. That's important. That would be an opportunity for some release of society, for sure. Uh, for you know, people may under under sixty or under forty, wherever you want to draw the line. We don't have underlying conditions. They all go back to work. Uh, you know, that would be one trigger. Uh, it may be a long time before that trigger hits. So we adequate ventilators. Uh, so we probably have to think of some other triggers. Maybe we'll just say, if you don't have an underlying condition and you're under 40, go back to work or under 60 mm -hmm. uh, and, and try to keep uh, people who are more vulnerable uh, more protected mm -hmm. and isolated. Uh, you know, again, we're not going to outlast the virus. Right. So you're, you're saying we're not going to kill the virus. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. And we're not going to, when I say I last, we're not going to be able to stay essentially closed down for the length of time. Right. That's not going to happen no, either. Natural, natural immunity. Yeah. So we're yeah, going to go back it, out yeah. at some point, but the virus will still be out there. Right. But, you know, again, we have natural immunity develops uh, from people who've been exposed. I mean, that is not an absolute certainty, but it's highly likely there have been, uh, you know, some small experiments in rhesus monkeys where it was impossible to reinfect the monkeys after they were exposed initially. So that's a very good sign that confirms that, you know, the, the thinking, again, we're not certain about reinfection at this point. But it's likely that, that, you know, you have immunity, you know, whether it's lasts for six months or a year, who knows, uh, or forever. Uh, don't we don't know. We won't know for a while. Uh, but, you know, that's one plus. So that's going to dampen an, uh, another wave. Uh, again, the therapeutic drugs, which I think are likely mm -hmm. more likely than not, uh, how soon they come online. Uh, and then, of course, the uh, the uh, holy grail, the vaccine, a good vaccine. You know, these daily conferences that President Trump has um, with the head of Health and Human Services on the podium and the Surgeon General right. is there and the Vice President is there. On the days when Dr. Fauci is not on the on the podium and that was like two days in a row last week, do you freak out? Yeah. Do you freak out like if you don't if you don't see him on that on that little stage in the White House press room. Um, well, you know, my I can't watch those press conferences. <laughs> yeah. I go down the hall and watch replays of football games on. Okay. You know, so you're saying I should, I should, <laughs> I should turn that off and go to that TV channel that has the old, that shows Bonanza, Barnaby Jones, Mannix. <laughs> just watch, just watch that, something other than, yeah, because it does make your mind go crazy um, watching this stuff. But Dr. Fauci, right? Are, are, it's like the whole country. Tony's good. Yeah, it's not, Tony is great. I think that I wish the CDC were back on the table at those press conferences as well. Uh, yeah, obviously, Tony's very good. Yeah, so when we don't and, see him, we, we get worried. Yeah, but apparently he was off uh, doing some actual work. 
Not that this is unimportant, because reassuring. He is the reassuring voice on there. I know, but I, when, I say we're, when I say we're worried, I don't mean I don't mean uh, the president's trying to muzzle him. I'm thinking he's 79 years old and he's sick today. Right. right. And now he's sick two days. And where is he? <laughs> Somebody. Yeah. yeah. I know. I don't think I'm the only one that thinks this. Um, no, the Washington Post wrote an article on, on that. Uh, again, I, and, you know, it all blurs together, uh, whether it was yesterday, day before today, who knows, <laughs> but they, they, they did a piece on exactly that. So, okay. So you're talking to quite a few people right now on this, uh, on this podcast. Um, we're going to hit our, we're going to hit our, we've only done this for three months and we're going to hit our seven millionth down, seven millionth download, uh, this, this week. Um, Congrats. congratulations. Yeah, no, 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 it's, it's been, a. Uh, of course, people don't have a lot else to do this. Yeah. They, this, <laughs> <laughs> yes. The bar is very low for our success. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so, uh, but, um, but I, I, I try to, I, I try to tell them the awful truth, but leave them with something to do or something to think about or some way to not allow. I don't like, I don't like hope. I really am. I'm because when we say hope these days, it so often is a false hope or a sugar coated hope, uh, just so that people feel better. Um, I don't, I don't know if. On some level, I don't know if I want to feel better. I want to be better. I want to live. I don't want to infect anybody else. I don't want anybody else infecting me. But I, but I'm not about. I don't wake up this morning saying, "Well, I just hope I, I hope I have some more hope today." <laughs> I just, I'm not there. I'm like, I'm in a fighting mode, and I want to do what I can do as a good citizen to, um, to get us to pull us through. And I want to help the people who are listening to this. I want to help pull them through. I want. I want all of us in the same boat working together. And so I ask you what I have asked other guests uh, this past week or two. Um, you know, I've asked you what you have done yourself uh, and you've given us some, I think some very, very good advice and some calming uh, advice, good calm, not bad calm that the, that the takeout food is not our enemy. Um, but you know, you have a chance to speak to at least a few hundred thousand people who might be listening right now. You know, what is it that you would uh, say to them in terms of what they can do um, and, and, and to help all of us get into a mindset of um, yes, we understand what's in front of us. We understand the danger, but we can't let that paralyze us. Okay. There are, there are, I guess, three points I could think of. Number one, Maintain discipline. Discipline. Do the jumping jacks right. Exactly. Do it the right way all the time. All the time. Every time. Otherwise, coach is not going to end this practice until we're all doing the jumping jacks all the same way, the right way, every time. Exactly. Jesus, you know, can I, can I just stop you right one. there, John? The American people, you, you're one of us, right? Um, you've been around for in this That's country right. for a while? Okay. <laughs> I can say so many great things about us. Here's one thing. <laughs> We're not a very disciplined people on many levels. We are, we are, we are the people who there is this sort of thing with the American dream we, that we live, that we, and it really, I try to tell people, you know, the word dream is in that term. It is a dream, not a reality. So, um, but we want to believe that just like I, I, I can go to the movies just once. It won't, it won't hurt me. I'll, I'll take Clorox wipes with me. And, and we talk ourselves into this thing where we, we, we can't discipline ourselves. We're, 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 you look at those, the pictures of the South Koreans and how they lined up and they got tested and they were like, and I thought, wow, we could, we could never do that. Do you remember the opening of the Beijing Olympics uh, a decade or so ago? That amazing, that routine that they did with the drummers and the dancers and everything. I thought no American I know can do that. We are not those people, John. I don't, I, I mean, talk me out, well, talk me out of that. Know, or, okay. Number one, it, you have both the issue of the community and the individual. There are individuals who are listening. who will be able to maintain that discipline. The more, who are capable of doing that, the better off we are. And 
you know, not only those individuals who do it right, but the entire society. The second, I said I sort of had three points that came to mind. Yeah. So that's number, number one. one uh, discipline. Uh, everybody. everybody. Discipline. The, the second one uh, involves community. Do something to help somebody else. Yeah. Even if it's only, you know, a really big tip on somebody who's delivering takeout or your groceries. Even if it's something is is relatively, and that's not insignificant to that person, but, you know, depending on who you are, where you are, and so forth, there might be something much more than that that you can do. Uh, you know, here in New Orleans, after Katrina, the traffic lights were out for months. So you had a four-way stop at every major intersection. That was one of the most lifting experiences of my life because everybody practically was courteous to everybody else at those four-way stop signs. It was amazing. It was a good feeling. Waving it, we were all in it together. The same thing walking down the street here. We are all in it together. You know, when we go for walks and we talk to people shouting across the street, proper distancing in the extreme, barely with an air shot, but, you know, there's a, it's a real warm feeling. And I hope that's sustainable. I think it is sustainable. That, that's something that your listeners can do. And the third thing I want to leave them with is, uh, is there is reason for optimism, <laughs> given the likelihood of drugs and uh, a vaccine. And even in the worst case, you know, this is not the bubonic plague. It is not going to wipe out a quarter to a third of the population, even in a worst case, even with the worst possible leadership. I could see in the worst possible case, with the medical system collapsing, no drugs being delivered, no vaccine, terrible political leadership, not only at the national level, but at every state level. Yes, I could see several million Americans die. But even, you know, that is not the end of civilization. Uh, and that's the absolute worst. You know, remember, this is, you know, even the elderly, and again, I'm one of them. I think the worst case is 90% of us survive. And that's the worst case. And in terms of <laughs> younger people, you know, a much higher proportion survive. <sighs> so am I afraid? Yeah, I'm afraid. Uh, I wish I wasn't, but I am. But it's not the end of the world. You know, we are going to recover from this. Uh, the one thing I agree with Trump on in terms of, I don't, wouldn't call it policy, but I think the economy will surge back when we release it. There'll be a tremendous amount of pent-up demand and so forth. It'll be like the end of, of World War II with everybody, except actually because of the virus, it may not be grabbing each other, grabbing strangers and hugging them in Times Square, but uh, there'll be a you know, feeling of great relief and so I, I guess I, I hope that was ending on a positive note. Although when I started, as long as it's not a false, as long as it's not a false positive, you know, it's uh, yeah. you no. Know, I think that's the world we want to look forward to, and uh, um, I think people want, you know, I think that what you said about the sense of community, I think that's very true, and and it puts people in a good mindset of how we're all in this together. Yeah, you know, I I called up for some takeout food um, the other night to, to, for delivery. And uh, there's a 90 year old uh, here in uh, in the um, building, person, friend. Um, and uh, I thought I I put the restaurant on hold, and I, I just rang him up and and said, uh, "Hey, I'm ordering some food. Do you need any?" Um, yeah. It's a little thing, but it really I think really um, it moved him, and um, and it was and it was also the right thing to do. And it felt good for me, and it re and then it reminded me, what other thing like that could I do during the day, or or whatever? How can I be 
you know, helpful here in some way. Um, um, more than just obviously, obviously doing this podcast to talk to people and to encourage them to, um, uh, do all the right things. And also, but also to act, um, to remember that they're citizens in a democracy, which, which demands participation and action. And you have to let your uh, representatives know how you feel about things. Um, there, there's always a political element, element to this, even when it's a health or medical issue, decisions are being made. Political decisions are being made that are going to affect how many of us are living, going to live and how many are going to die. So all of those things. And I think, so I'm glad you said those things. And, uh, you left out when we, when Basil and I can start dating again, but, uh, <laughs> not, not, not each other, of course, but I'm just saying, you know, um, it's, uh, it seems like a time where we are, we are, it, it, this is an inward time, um, that we are in and we are not going to be around, uh, people. And, um, um, we look forward to the time when, when we are with our friends and neighbors and family and, and all of that, um, you know, people have el- you got elderly it. parents and you want to go check in on your parents while well, you can't do that, you know? So, um, John, uh, I want to thank you. I want to thank you. You, you are the Bill Parcells of pandemics. Uh, you are, you're not the Bill Belichick. Uh, uh, we can't say the name of that name on this podcast, but, uh, but yeah. Oh, well, I'm, I'm originally from Providence. Oh, you are. So okay. I, well then we allow that. We allow that. You know what? There all the rules are, are off the table here during the pandemic. So yes, you can, yeah. You can reference uh, Belichick, uh, but um, but I think your your point about our discipline um, and and being vigilant and 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 consistent with that uh, is going to save a, a lot of people and and also to get off this thing I think that we're on that we started unfortunately saying that young people are going to be okay nobody under thirty has died et cetera et cetera that was a wrong message to send out and um, you know that statistic yesterday from the governor of New York that. Uh, Half of the uh, the cases here are people between the ages of eighteen and forty nine years old. Um, so that was the big wake up call, I think, uh, yesterday uh, when that statistic came out. Right, up. right. Uh, so everybody, right. everybody has to get on board. Everybody uh, has to join in and participate in the things that we have to do uh, to take care of each other. Um, uh, John Barry um, has uh, been my guest. Uh, he is a professor at uh, Tulane. Uh, university and wrote uh, the great book uh, called The Great Influenza uh, about the uh, the flu of 1918. Much to be learned there. Thank you for sharing uh, what you've learned uh, with us and um, please stay well. Um, and okay. Well, it's been my pleasure. Listen to your wife. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, John. And thank you to everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Take care uh, who is listening today here on Rumble. Uh, This is Michael Moore, and hopefully we'll be back again tomorrow or the next day uh, with another episode of Rumble. I appreciate uh, you being with me uh, during uh, this time and uh, and sharing with me what you're going through. Um, Please feel free to do that on your podcast uh, platform. We love hearing from you, and um, uh, take care of yourself. And um, uh, Basil, you take care of yourself, too. Okay. (laughs) All right. Be well, everybody. Take care. Thanks. 